here just because what you all are doing in practice focusing on details is a spiritual truth of our country you know we can be democrats and republicans but most americans are patriots for over a decade now good ideas have emanated from the bpc thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy. Uh, Senator, you, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Welcome to this Bipartisan Policy Center event, Building a Congress That Works, a conversation with modernization leaders. My name is Michael Thorning. I am the Director of Structural Democracy here at BPC. Uh, today, we are joined by Representative Derek Kilmer and Representative William Timmons, Chair and Vice Chair of the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Uh, Chair Kilmer has represented Washington's sixth congressional district since 2013. And Vice Chair Timmons has represented South Carolina's fourth congressional district since 2019. Uh, welcome back, both of you, and thank you for being here. You bet. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Um, for um, our audience, if you'd like to submit questions for our panelists, uh, you can do so in the YouTube chat or on Twitter using hashtag BPC Live. <clears throat> In 2019, the House of Representatives established the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, originally with a one-year tenure. 
The House twice voted to extend the committee, once in 2019 and again in 2021. And just two weeks ago, the committee approved its final report. In that time, the committee has held 38 hearings, seven business meetings, or sorry, seven virtual discussions, 11 business meetings. They've spoken to scores of witnesses, uh, count, consulted countless experts, uh, and made more than 200 recommendations for improving Congress. Um, Chair Kilmer, if I may start with you, can you give our audience just a brief history of the Modernization Committee? Uh, why was it formed and what sorts of issues have you tackled? Yeah, again, thanks for having us. Uh, about every 20 or 30 years or so, Congress realizes things aren't working the way they ought to, and they create a committee to do something about it. Uh, and this was the most recent iteration of it. Uh, prior to that, there was one in the early 90s. And, you know, it, it originated out of some discussions focused uh, right before the beginning of the 116th Congress on rules changes. And there were members across the aisle having discussions around potential changes to the rules package and issues would come up like, you know, how do we do a better job as an institution of retaining staff, or how do we use technology in a way that uh, that's taking advantage of innovation in a way Congress doesn't currently, or how do we have this place seem less like the Jerry Springer show and more like a institution that's focused on making progress for the American people. In each of those instances, we sort of concluded that's not really a rules package problem. That's something that needs to be looked at by a committee. And so at the beginning of the 116th Congress, this committee was formed really with an eye towards addressing those issues and some others. Uh, you know, we certainly were asked to look at issues related to rules and procedures, schedule and calendar, civility and collaboration. We were asked to look at the, how Congress uses technology, how we engage with our constituents. Um, and how we recruit, retain, and have a diverse staff. And uh, to the credit of the members of the committee, um, we worked hard and we worked in a bipartisan way and were, as you mentioned, able to make more than 200 recommendations, about two thirds of which have either been implemented or are on the path to implementation. That's wonderful. Uh, Vice Chair Timmons, if I could turn to you, uh, why should it matter to Americans that Congress is trying to fix itself in this way? Well, uh, we have an incredibly low approval rating, and it's somewhat well-deserved. Uh, we've had a lot of gridlock over the years. We have major challenges facing this country that we've been un unable to resolve, whether it's immigration, health care, debt, deficit spending. Um, these challenges are addressed through Twitter on talking points and not through legitimate legislation. We need to be doing our job. Our job is to engage in evidence-based policymaking in a collaborative manner from a position of mutual respect. That's how we actually make progress, and that's how we get the American people what they deserve. This committee has been working for four years and made 202 recommendations on how to get back to just that. And we've made a lot of progress. We've implemented along the way, which has been wonderful, and we still have work to do on implementation. But I believe that the recommendations we've made, um, it will take time, but it will heal this institution, and we will get better results for the American people, and that's what they deserve, and that's what they want. You know, after four years, as we said, this committee has more than 200 recommendations to show for its work, um, all of which were adopted on a bipartisan basis, uh, and almost all of which were adopted unanimously. We don't often see that kind of cooperation in committees. So I have to ask, how did you do it? You know, what, what is the secret sauce here? And what can other committees do if they want to achieve these kinds of results? So one of the things we decided to do at the beginning of this exercise was just to recognize that if you want things to work differently in Congress, you need to do things differently in Congress. When this committee was established, we got our budget for the committee. And one of the first and unusual things I did is I called my then vice chair, uh, Tom Graves, and said, so I've got a crazy idea for you. You know, with every committee in Congress, they get their money and they cut it in half and Democrats use their half of the money to hire people with a Democratic background who put on blue jerseys and Republicans use their half of the money to hire people with a Republican background who put on red jerseys. And I said, what if we don't do that? What if we just hire one staff and some of them will be Democrats and some will be Republicans, but they'll all put on jerseys that say, hey, let's fix Congress. And to his credit and to Vice Chair Timmons' credit, they were on board with that. So we had a, we had a committee out of the gate with a staff that was working together 
you know, had their oars in the water rowing in the same direction rather than having the oars out of the water beating each other over the heads. One of the other things that we did at the beginning of uh, our um, uh, of our existence was we did a bipartisan planning retreat. We went over to the Library of Congress and said, hey, what, what do we want to get done as a group? And I don't think any other committee in Congress does that in a bipartisan way. But, you know, we actually started by saying, why are you in Congress? Like, what brought you here? And how has it met or failed to meet your expectations? Just having those discussions, Democrats and Republicans, you know, the funny thing is, I, I don't, if you had been a fly on the wall, I'm not sure you would have known who the Democrats were and who the Republicans were, which I think is actually kind of interesting. Um, beyond that, if you watch one of our hearings on C-SPAN, you have too much time on your hands. But if you watch one of our hearings on C-SPAN, you'll notice a few things. One, we don't sit with Democrats on one side of the dais and Republicans on the other. Why? Well, when I hear a witness say something interesting, my genetic predisposition is to lean over to the person next to me and say, yeah, that was kind of interesting. What do you think about that? And in our committee, when you lean over next to someone, you lean over to someone from a different party. We actually don't even sit on a dais. We sit around a round table. Why? Well, I don't know about you. I have never had a good conversation speaking to the back of somebody's head. And so we sit in a circle, so we're in a round table, so that we can look each other in the eye and actually have dialogue. We also don't hold people to five minutes. If someone, if someone is asking a question and it's interesting, you can just raise your hand and say, I want to pull on that thread a little bit. And what it means is you don't have people who are just speechifying to get a clip on social media. We're actually trying to learn together and solve problems together. And I think that's what the American people ought to expect uh, of their leaders. Let me just add a couple other things. Um, speaking of leaders, Chair Kilmer and Vice Chair Graves set the tone early on. Um, they said that we were going to work hard to try to get results. This was not a partisan committee, and um, we were going to find common ground. We're going to pass recommendations and fix this place. And their leadership at the outset set the tone, and I did my best to step into Tom Graves' shoes, and um, I had a remarkably, it's been such a productive relationship with uh, Chair Kilmer, we've really become friends and it's bared a lot of fruit. So we're in a very good position to to make legis to make policy, to make recommendations because of relationships. And I've been on three other committees in Congress and um, the chair of those committees um, did not know me. We never talked, we never engaged in conversations. And that's a structural issue, but it's also, a, again, a culture issue, a norm issue. And it's something that we've sought to change. So we've made a number of recommendations surrounding relationship building. Uh, just last night, we had a civility dinner at the Library of Congress where we had, I don't know, 40 plus members of Congress that were there to break bread and to get to know one another. And it was a, a huge success. And um, we've made a number of other recommendations. The committees are encouraged to, at the beginning of each Congress, have a bipartisan dinner where they can put all policies aside, just get to know one another. And we're trying to create space in the Capitol so members can have neutral ground where they can engage in uh, policy conversations. There's literally dozens and dozens of recommendations designed to mimic what we found was so successful in the Modernization Committee. And it, it worked for us and we hope that it'll work for other committees. You know, uh, as you're saying, a major focus for the Modernization Committee was building bipartisanship uh, civility and collaboration in Congress, which uh, is obviously an issue near and dear to our heart here at BPC. Um, you know, one program that we have run since 2018, the American Congressional Exchange, seeks to have members visit each other in their home districts. And I know the committee made a similar recommendation to try to encourage members to travel, to visit each other in their own communities. Um, Chair Kilmer, you have some experience. You participated in our ACE program. I wonder if you could talk about how those kinds of experiences help to build relationships among members and why it's important. I think it's really important. I think part of the way members of Congress get a better understanding of where people are coming from is to actually understand where people are coming from. You know, I actually did a exchange with Steve Womack, who is a Republican from Arkansas. I went to his district and he came to mine. And, you know, I can't tell you what it was like to take him to the port of Tacoma. And the port did a bang up job of, you know, saying, here's how many containers originate in Arkansas and end up going 
to the rest of the world through our port. And here's how many containers come into our port and end up going to Arkansas. And as we pulled away, uh, uh, Congressman Womack said, Kilmer, I don't know how you did it, but suddenly I care about freight mobility in the Puget Sound region. You know, we went up Hurricane Ridge in Olympic National Park and the Park Service did a presentation on some of the challenges facing our national parks, including the maintenance backlog in our park system. And as we headed back down the mountain, uh, Congressman Womack said, all of a sudden I care about maintenance problems in national parks. You know, so that can be helpful for just getting an understanding of why someone has a priority that they have because so much of that is grounded in the district that they represent. So I really applaud the BPC for for doing those exchanges. I think they really they really matter. A lot of the recommendations that we made around bipartisanship and civility were really oriented towards fostering discussion between Democrats and Republicans. You know, and, and if, if I can just say one more thing on that, if that's all right, we we had. Uh, you know, we listened to a bunch of experts. We brought in experts from organizational psychology and conflict resolution and strategic negotiations and culture change. And we talked to uh, political consultants and management consultants. And uh, I thought about consulting an exorcist uh, just to figure out how do you get Congress to function more collaboratively. And after one of our hearings, one of the organizational psychologists said, you know, you should really talk to this sports coach because he took over a team that had a loser uh, culture and, um, and turn it into a winner. So I call up this football coach and I said, so what do you do when you have players on the team who are actively trying to sabotage the team? And he said, well, I cut them. I said, well, we don't really have that option. And he said, well, then I bench them. He said, we don't really have that option either. And he said, well, let me ask you something. I said, sure. He said, how do you guys do new player orientation? So well, we don't really have new players, but we have new member orientation. And he said, how does it work? And I said, you know, it's funny you say that. It works entirely the wrong way. I said, you show up to orientation. They literally say, Democrats, you get on this bus. Republicans, you get on that bus. And the entire orientation process is designed to keep Democrats and Republicans from interacting with each other. And the sports coach I talked to said, you know, Derek, I don't know much about Congress, but it seems like you ought to stop doing that. So one of our recommendations was stop doing that. And this round of freshmen that's going through orientation right now is the first round of freshmen that are going to have a more collaborative experience with their colleagues across the aisle. That's a fantastic that. example. Just on Monday night of this week, uh, there was a new member orientation uh, at a nearby restaurant. And uh, it was bipartisan, and we had raved reviews about an opportunity to build relationships with members across the aisle. It was their first opportunity. They've been through orientation for a number of days, so um, we are implementing our recommendations, and they are having an impact. Um, so I also want to point out some of my closest friends have come from this committee. Um, the chairman and I have worked together on uh, unrelated legislation because of our relationship, uh, Ed Perlmutter, Dean Phillips, Nakima Williams. I work with them on a number of issues that I would never have worked with them, but for the relationship that we built. We trust one another. We're friends. And if they have an issue that is important to them that I can support, I want to support it. Don't get me wrong. I oftentimes say I can't do that, but we disagree respectfully and we continue to find ways to work together. And that's how this place is supposed to work. If you don't know anybody on the other side of the aisle, you're never going to be able to work together. And it starts at orientation where you are literally, I, I had the experience. I thought they were joking. Go get on the Republican bus, not, not the Democrat bus. And it was that was the tone that was set. We are ending that. Uh, this Congress will be different. We are facilitating relationships at every turn, every way we possibly can. And I do believe it will have an impact. And I think uh, we'll be better off for it. You know, relationship building and collaboration take trust, but obviously they also take time, something in short supply for members of Congress. The committee made a number of recommendations related to the congressional calendar and schedule. Vice Chair Timmons, I know this was a particular passion project for you. Uh, how does the congressional calendar and the schedule impact Congress as an institution, its functionality, and why is it important to fix it? And what do you see as some of the potential solutions? Sure, well, in 2019, we had 66 travel days and 65 full working days. 
Um, the travel days don't really count. It's a bed check vote uh, or a fly out vote. And so we had 65 days to do our job. And so all the committee hearings, subcommittee hearings, um, fundraising, votes, constituent meetings, everything that we do when we're here, it's just chaos. I call it ping ponging. We ping, ping pong all around the Capitol, all around the Hill. And it's just really inefficient, uh, particularly in our uh, committee work. Nobody is in the room when I speak at the bottom of the dais, my five minutes, I look around, there's three or four people in a committee that has 55 people on it. And that's because they're all busy. And so we don't actually engage in dialogue. Nobody defends their ideas. Uh, we need to get back to that. So the recommendations we made were to travel less, work more, and then deconflict the schedule. And uh, we made a recommendation of having a committee calendar that is common to all committees. And then it's likely that in this rules package, we're hopeful that all committee chairmen will be required to put the schedule of their committee and their hearings into this common calendar. That's step one. Step two is to deconflict. Uh, the average member of Congress serves on 5.4 committees and subcommittees. Uh, some members serve on many more than that. So we need to maximize the chance for members to actually be in their chair, understanding uh, the, the policy issues that are being considered and having, having dialogue. In four years, only one instance, only one instance of a subcommittee hearing on financial institutions for the Financial Services Committee, um, me and Ed Perlmutter had back and forth for like an hour. And the different members on the committee, we had back and forth with the witnesses. It was really refreshing. We all learned a lot. We enjoyed it. Um, that's how this place is supposed to work. Everyone learns something. Everyone's ideas changed to some degree. And that is how we make progress. If you're not in the room, if you're not defending your ideas, if you're not able to articulate why you think a certain policy is the best path forward, we're never going to come to find common ground. So uh, calendar and schedule are very important. Uh, getting more time in Washington to do our jobs and then uh, being present more for our committee work is is very important. And we've made a lot of recommendations. And I think uh, this next Congress, we're going to see, see those recommendations bear fruit. Um, you know, one thing many Americans miss, because it doesn't happen as much on national television, is that your work as representatives happens as much in your districts as it does in D.C. Um, each member has offices and staff in their local community who hear from constituents on issues, they help them navigate obstacles with the federal bureaucracy, and they look for opportunities where Congress can act to improve a situation, maybe support a local initiative like an infrastructure project. Uh, how do district office staff figure into the institution of Congress, and what can Congress do to make them more effective and to deliver more for your constituents? District staff are really important. Uh, they're on the front lines when it comes to helping our constituents uh, navigate federal programs or inquiries. You know, we on a daily basis get folks who are reaching out because they've got an issue with their Social Security benefits or issues with the VA or, um, you know, lately it's been a bunch of people who are traveling for the first time in a long time and didn't realize they didn't, you know, didn't have an up to date passport. You know, our offices can help with that. Um, you know, and they're also, sort of our feet on the street in terms of outreaching to our constituents. And, you know, the challenges that district offices face are different than some of the issues in DC. Some are the same, you know, some of the issues related to the challenges of having adequate compensation, which we made some recommendations around uh, having adequate training opportunities so that they can get better at their job so that there can be an avenue for professional development. You know, we made some recommendations in that space too, uh, making sure that district offices have access to up-to-date technology and can like get on wi-fi is you know sh shouldn't take an act of congress but unfortunately it did take a recommendation from our committee to address some of those issues related to technology access i'll mention just one other thing on this front you know because our uh, our district staff work so much on casework and on agency issues you know right now you may have 20 different offices dealing with the exact same problem with the VA, but there is no system through which that <laughs> systemic problem can be identified. Instead, it's 20 separate data points all never connecting with each other. So one of the recommendations that we made was have some means of having anonymized information about a casework issue so that 
if we start to identify systemic problems with Social Security or with the VA or with Medicare or with OPM or, you know, or immigration, you name it, that there's some means of identifying those problems and then addressing them rather than just having a bunch of folks sort of um, in the wilderness trying to navigate these issues on their own. Um, you know, while we're at the intersection of national uh, policy making in Washington and local issues, a major recommendation for this committee was to reform the old process known as earmarking uh, by making it more transparent and accountable, uh, fiscally responsible and ethical. Uh, and not long after the committee's recommendation, Congress decided to restore that practice very much in line with what the committee envisioned for congressionally directed spending. Uh, the House now calls this community project funding. Uh, what were the crucial reforms needed to reestablish trust in this aspect of Congress's power of the purse? And how does community project funding align with the committee's mission? You want me to go, William? Mr. Chairman, you take the lead. Sure. Well, so, you know, one of the things that we looked at was how to restore the constitutional authorities that were granted to Congress under Article One, and one of the big ones is the power of the purse. And I think there was recognition from Democrats and Republicans on the committee and in the Congress that members are closest to the communities that they serve and best know the needs of those communities and have a better understanding of how dollars ought to be spent to address those challenges in their communities. I know far better than, you know, terrifically well-intentioned people sitting in marble buildings in Washington, D.C. I, I know better the needs of my community because I'm from my community. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, attached to my community. I have connections within my community. And, you know, obviously there were concerns from the previous approach that there was potential for abuse, that there was a lack of transparency, um, that it constituted too much of the appropriations process. And so we sat down as a committee and sort of hammered out a new approach that was more transparent, where members would have to list every request that they made, make it publicly available on their website, that they would be limited to making requests to um, governmental and uh, governmental entities, uh, local governments, tribal governments, and nonprofits that serve sort of a governmental purpose. Um, you know, that they would have to attest that there's no um, conflicts of interest, uh, no connection to family or those sorts of things. Uh, and that it was limited, that members would be limited in how many requests that they could make and how much a total percentage of the um, appropriations process that these community uh, projects could uh, could comprise. And when we worked that out, I think members said, yeah, this is a new approach and it is more in line with our Article One authorities, and it will prevent the kind of abuse that we've seen in the past. And I think if you look at the last couple of years as an example, I think it really worked. And uh, I give credit to the leadership of the Appropriations Committee for largely taking our recommendation and using it. Um, I want to just take an opportunity to say for uh, our audience that um, now's a good time. Um, we'll, in a couple of minutes, move to our Q&A portion. If um, you'd like to submit a question for our panelists, you can do so in the YouTube chat or on Twitter using hashtag BPC Live. Um, maybe sort of to bookend at least our part of the discussion, uh, two weeks ago, the committee held its final business meeting uh, after four years of work. Um, how does the work of modernizing Congress continue from here? What can members of Congress do to ensure that it continues? And what can the rest of us Americans do to make sure that Congress lives up to its full potential? I'll take lead on this, Mr. Chairman. So um, we made a number of recommendations surrounding this. One recommendation is that we don't wait 20 or 30 years to do this again. So um, every four Congresses is what we recommended. I think that's a, a very reasonable number. But in the interim, we recommended a subcommittee under House administration and hopefully even a select subcommittee. Um, so the idea would be that 
over the next four Congresses, uh, a group of members will continue to work on implementing uh, the work, that, the 202 recommendations that we've already made, while also compiling a list of things that we need to look into next time this becomes a, a select committee again. And I'm optimistic that next Congress we will have that. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, the two of us can continue to serve on it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I do think that there's a lot of work that can be done um, next year regarding implementation. And if we structure a, a, a subcommittee or a select subcommittee on House administration correctly, uh, we'll be able to get a lot done and hopefully fully implement our recommendations. So uh, the work's not done. We've, we, we will continue to push hard. Chair Kilmer, anything you'd like to add? I think the, you know, the, the main takeaway that I have, well, one of the big takeaways that I have is that these discussions around organizational effectiveness cannot just happen every 20 or 30 years. They have to be a matter of course, you know, for an institution to improve, there has to be a constant focus on improvement. And so I think it's important, the recommendations that William just spoke to, uh, that they be implemented, that we have uh, effort to implement this, uh, these recommendations that we've made. As I mentioned, we've made tremendous progress in that regard that makes us unique among the select committees and that we've been working on implementation while we still existed. Um, historically, that's that's now it's worked. You know, more often than not, these select committees don't pass anything. Um, and then if they do, uh, things don't get implemented for two, three, four years down the road. Um, you know, we, I kept sort of joking that we were like the, you know, the fake bank ad on uh, Saturday Night Live where it's the bank that only makes change. You know, their tagline is, we make change. It's what we do. Uh, and our, our goal was not just to make recommendations, it was to make change. And that's that's what we're gonna continue pushing on to make sure these recommendations get implemented. Uh, we've got uh, some questions here from the audience that I think we're ready to move to. Uh, the first one is from Jim Hamby. He asks, uh, was it within the scope of the committee to address electoral structures like closed primaries, single member districts, plurality-based winners, et cetera? We it was among the things we, sorry, go ahead, William. We had a number of uh, discussions about it. We had a hearing on it. It was a challenging area to get consensus on. At the end of the day, I mean, until I got to Congress, I had no idea the disparity between South Carolina and Washington State, for example, and how we conduct elections. Um, it really was uh, eye-opening. And I think the it was just challenging for us to come to any agreement on recommendations, but we did fully consider them and, and give it a shot. Chair Kilmer, anything to add there? No, I, I, I think, you know, there are some, so we weren't assigned to those issues. We'd still decided to do a hearing, looking at how members get to Congress, looking at some of these issues related to, um, everything from, you know, how members get to Congress to the size of the House even. Um, but in the end, as, as Vice Chair Timmons mentioned, we weren't able to find consensus. The rule that established our committee required that we get a two thirds vote to pass any recommendations. And that's a high hurdle, um, making it, you know, all the more impressive that we were able to get more than 200 recommendations passed. But there were some things, you know, around things like primaries or campaign finance that we just couldn't, uh, couldn't land the plane on. Our next question from Jaden Klubeck. Uh, what are the technological innovations that the committee recommends for Congress? You want me to take that, William? Sure, sure. You lead, you lead I'll follow up. Sure. So we made a number of recommendations related to technology, and it was out of a recognition that, you know, Congress has been described as a 18th century institution using 20th century technology to solve 21st century problems. I think that's candidly a pretty apt uh, a description of the institution and it's a problem. Um, it's a problem when the institution doesn't have up-to-date technology. So some of the recommendations we made were really trying to improve the process of onboarding new technology um, of having a more clear process so that entrepreneurs, the innovators would want to 
drive innovation to this institution, um, making sure that when there are uh, applications that are developed in-house, that they're open source so that they can be built upon. Um, you know, doing a better job of aligning some of the technology standards between the House and the Senate. Uh, you know, having a, a House digital service that's really focused on some of these technology issues. All of these are issues that we addressed within our committee. And, um, you know, I think uh, this is an area where thankfully you're starting to already see a fair amount of implementation trying to move things forward. And, and I think that's, um, I think that's important. There are, uh, you know, there's some other issues that we made recommendations on, um, uh, things like reforms to the House Information Resources, HIR, you know, having them, uh, you know, prioritize certain tech improvements that, you know, that members have identified as key, um, having them re reform part of the approval process for working with outside technology vendors, again, with the, with the hope that the institution becomes a better place to work with so that technologists actually want to work in this institution. Congressman Timmons, anything to add? You know, I, I remember I was a, a staffer on the Senate side years ago, and we had to run around and use the auto pen machine to get signatures. And it was very challenging. We literally only went to digital signatures in the House, just what, 116th Congress. So, I mean, we're still working on that for constituent services, um, but we have made that recommendation and it will be implemented shortly. Um, something as simple as getting Wi-Fi in our district offices. I mean, it, so there was a lot of low hanging fruit, but um, we're going to continue to try to find ways to use technology to make us more efficient uh, at our jobs because it, it's the path forward and it will allow us to get more done with less resources. And that is uh, one of our big objectives. So um, stay tuned. Uh, our next question comes from Daniel Stid. It's a topic you briefly touched on, but um, could you say more about how you approached and tracked implementation of the recommendations and the difference that made in the committee's overall impact? Well, in our office, in the Cannon House office building, we had this massive wall and it had all the recommendations that were printed on it. And there were check marks in uh, either green, yellow or red. And um, it was fun to get up there and to check one off in green. And um, that's how we tracked it. And it was kind of like a scoreboard. And um, the team, uh, the modernization staff worked very hard at implementation and um, we had a lot of positive results, but again, we're going to continue working on, I think two thirds have been implemented to some degree, but um, we're going to hit hundred uh, percent in the next few months, hopefully. Um, this question from John Thomas, uh, from your time on the committee, what were the best ideas you heard about how representatives can better listen to and receive feedback from their constituents? Uh, and what are the most realistic? Well, the chairman and I did this incredible video teleconference, telephone town hall, VTC town hall. Um, we had thousands of people sign on. It was truly incredible. And um, I've done telephone town halls before, and that's different. But the video teleconference was just very useful. And it incorporated um, a survey in it, and it allowed people to ask questions and get real-time feedback. And it was really incredible. We learned a lot and we got a lot of positive feedback. So that's the best one that comes to mind. Yeah, that's the same answer I would give too. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that was a, a neat idea. Um, I learned a lot from it. We were able to get data from it about people's ingoing assumptions and what they thought after the fact on certain issues. That was really helpful. Our next question from Alan Cohn, to what extent do you see the output of the committee reducing the anticipated gridlock of the divided Congress will have starting next year? Well, I, I do think next year is gonna be particularly challenging um, with the very narrow majority and the divided government, but ho hopefully uh, we will be able to use the relationships that we're building to try to find common ground and find some Policy, Mr. Chairman. 
you take it away. Okay. I think the vice chair is choking. Um, the, uh, so I, I am actually hopeful that, again, some of the recommendations that we've made will be implemented and that they will serve the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of tagline, and it wasn't just a tagline, it was a mission that every member of our committee had was with each of these recommendations, we wanted to add the phrase, so that Congress works better for the American people. And, you know, so if the institution, and we made, you know, more than a dozen recommendations about staffing, just as an example, how can the institution do a better job of recruiting, retaining, training, and having more diverse staff? If this institution can succeed in doing that, and we've made recommendations to do that, that are being implemented, it means that talented people will wanna work here and that you won't see sort of the brain drain that you've seen over the years where people at some point say, gosh, you know, this isn't such a great place to work and I can get paid far more doing something on K Street and they bail, right? And so that is a good example of things that may not seem tangible in the near term, but over the long haul may help the institution punch at or above its weight rather than as I think the American people have identified below its weight. Um, you know, one sort of related uh, question that comes to mind, you talked about um, staff recruitment and retention and diversity. Um, I think an early concern about this committee was that it was actually just going to be the, the member pay raise committee. And to your credit, that didn't come to fruition. Um, how did that not come about? Well, we definitely looked into it. It is a, a challenging issue. We've denied ourselves a cost of living adjustment for 12 years and it, it has created problems. Um, really, that's a leadership question and whether that will happen is gonna be decided by the speaker and the, the Democrat leader next Congress. I do not anticipate it happening. Um, there's another question here with more than 200 recommendations. Obviously, we haven't had time to cover every topic that this committee worked on. Um, but what is a recommendation we haven't covered that you think will make Congress a better institution and that the American people should know about? You know, one that I, I you know, we've talked about a lot of the ones that are my favorites, but, um, you know, one of the ones we haven't talked about is the establishment of a, uh, of a, Profession, of professional development opportunities for members. You know, I was a management consultant for McKinsey and Company. I worked for, in, for an economic development agency. Congress is the first place that I've worked where with the exception of freshman orientation, there is no professional development opportunities. And, you know, so there, there's a, a clear question of how, how do you expect people to get better at their jobs? You know, when someone becomes a chair, you know, it's funny when I was in the state legislature and I became the chair of the higher education committee committee, I remember calling the National Council of State Legislatures and saying, do you have any how to guides on how to be a good chair? And they actually sent me like the three CD set and I would like listen to it on my drive to Olympia, which tells you how long ago this was. Um, but I, I, I do think that's important if you want members of Congress to do better at their jobs, to be better at their jobs. There has to be some means of helping them get better at their jobs. And, you know, there are outside organizations and BPC does this to some extent. Congressional Management Foundation does this to their credit. Um, but having some in-house capacity to help members get better at their jobs and staff. I mean, the, the Congressional Staff Academy is also a big part of this offering voluntary training opportunities to our staff members so that they can get better at their jobs too. And that's exciting. But listen, I'm, I'm, go, I'm doing annual reviews with my staff right now. The number of staff members who've said, I'm just really excited to sign up for this professional development course or that professional development course, people want to learn in their jobs. And Congress has not always been a terrific place that enables that. We're working to change that. And I do think it will help the institution function better for the American people. Mine is just time. We got to make it more predictable, the schedule more predictable. We have to have more time to do our jobs. And we've made a number of recommendations on that. I do think that we're going to see some improvement next Congress, but we can always get better every 10 minutes here that affects 435 people and the people that work with them and our constituents, it, it makes a big impact. So time is something I'll be continuing to focus on. 
Uh, Representative Derek Kilmer, Representative William Timmons, Chair and Vice Chair of the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Four years of just remarkable work and remarkable accomplishments, 200 recommendations uh, to improve Congress, our, one of our most important democratic institutions. Um, on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center, we wanna thank you for all that you, your committee, your staff have done over this time uh, and congratulate you and thank you for joining us and thank you to our audience. Thank you and thank for the BPC's partnership. Great to be with you. Thank you for having us.